Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Professor Santosh Narona from IIT Bombay will continue his lecture about considerations of data analysis especially for the OMETS data sets. Today's lecture is going to be about why basic understanding of data analysis is required. For example, 0 0.5 percent accepted error rate in significance used without basic understanding of data may result in false interpretations. Professor Narona will also talk about the importance of replicates and how one should choose controls which are usually one of the very important samples for the big data or the omics based experiments. So, again thinking about a good experimental design, what should be replicates, what should be your strategy for data analysis actually determine the meaningful sense of your experiments despite all the advancements in these technologies and the pace at which we could generate the data, but still getting meaningful data is not straightforward, it is not easy. So, I hope today's lecture and based on the previous lectures, these two lectures will illuminate your knowledge and give you the concepts about good experimental designing and what should be the considerations to look for to get the meaningful insights from your data. So, let us welcome Professor Santosh Narona. We systematically tested so many possible candidates for significance and if there was a 5 percent error rate in your analysis, you would have randomly found a candidate and called it significant. And we end up fixating all our energies on, on these one or two candidates that we get when it is sheer randomness that has caused these to turn up. So, unless you have an independent way of carrying out an analysis with these candidates and validating that they are important to you, it is kind of pointless proceeding further. Now, at this point it for if you are in the publishing game, it is very important that you, you notice that publications do not allow you to publish negative results. So, all these other things you cannot publish here. So, the only thing you can publish is this particular result. So, there is pressure on you to find that needle in a haystack has a positive result and publish it. And that is the nature of this confirmation bias and p hacking okay, which pushes you into now focusing entirely your research on this particular candidate, the green candidate as if it were the only relevant candidate. So, what is the way around this? So, again something that we typically do not do is, is an adjustment to this. So, the only way to if, if there is a 5 percent error rate in analysis and 5 percent error rate is a dangerous thing if you are doing 10,000 studies. I mean I, I want you to appreciate this 5 percent at a different level. You take any 100 papers published which are scientific hypothesis being tested and I can tell you without even reading those papers that 5 of them have got to be false. Because all of them have used a 95 percent confidence level for executing this analysis. And if you are saying there is a 5 percent sheer bad luck error rate, then several of those researchers have suffered unfortunately with randomness in the data they collected, which means their results are going to be false. It is not that they have set out to cheat, it is unfortunate given that they are unable to reproduce their own data and they are trying, they are in a rush to publish. So, the trick, the way to control for this <coughs> in some ways, so how do I reduce my error rate? So, if my error rate is this red portion, the 5 percent. If I want to reduce my error rate, I have to move my goal post further out and that is the only solution. Of course, now it gets hard. The number of candidates you will get which pass this goal post further out which are so extreme, what you are saying is your results must be so extreme that they are well outside this wider goal post range. So, what, what do you say if you are going to do 10,000 tests, each test should not have been done at a 5 percent level instead each test should have been done at a 
phi divided by the 1000 or 10000 if I am doing 10000 tests. So that 5 percent error rate should be spread across the 10000 tests that you are doing and if you were to attempt that th this area now is phi over 10000. So it become a tiny area but I have effectively pushed my goal post out. So the odds of now passing my test are much much lower and the odds of randomly passing my test have gone down and that is a core trick to the statistical analysis. It is called a Bonferroni adjustment and good packages software packages for omics testing will have this as a setting where you can correct for the number of tests that you are doing and try to refine this and it is a critical thing. So in other words one of the things you ought not to be doing in an omics framework where statistical tools are being provided to you by the manufacturer is use a default setting in a workflow. You have got to ask the question what are the settings okay, which control for statistical significance and do these need to be tweaked to correct for the number of studies you propose to do on that software. There is this aspect of power of a test and what I want you to appreciate is while all the emphasis on asking is a genetic candidate, is a gene candidate significant or not, all of this involves in only looking at this particular curve. So if you look at this particular curve, forget the other curve for a moment, if you are looking at this particular curve then your 95 percent confidence leaves out this blue area on either side, that is at 5 percent, the blue area would have been 5 percent. But for the sake of argument I am going to uh, pretend as if the reality was some other hypothesis under which this would have been a mean value and this would have been a range of outcomes I would have seen if some other hypothesis were true and that is just for the sake of argument because now you will see something problematic happen. If this hypothesis were true then this blue area corresponds to that percentage of time you are going to get your hypothesis outcome wrong. So that 5 percent of the time we are getting a hypothesis outcome wrong under the null hypothesis. What do these thresholds mean for you? Within these thresholds you say this hypothesis is okay, I am in agreement with that hypothesis. Outside that th those uh, thresholds you end up saying I do not believe in this hypothesis, I will go with the other hypothesis in this case H1. If you now look at H1, H1 is allowed to be true only from this coordinate to the right beyond that region you believe in H1, to the left you are you, you have already argued you prefer to go with H0 as a hypothesis. But do you now see under H1 this area in purple corresponds to an error where H1 could have been the true hypothesis, you have gone with H0 therefore as a technicality you are committing a mistake by saying H0 is true when H1 should have been true. So there is a mistake, there is a mistake, it is just like false positives and false negatives. In fact it is related to the concept of false positives and false negatives. You will make one mistake or the other. If you were to create a diagnostic kit and you are going to change the threshold for detection of a particular measurement in trying to cut down the false positives, just think about this. If I take this threshold and I move it to the right, if I take this threshold and I move it to the right under the H0 curve, what will happen to the blue area? The blue area goes down. I commit less of a mistake with respect to my original hypothesis. But if I move this coordinate to the right, what happens to the purple area? The purple area grows. If you are trying to minimize false positives in your analysis, you run the risk of increasing false negatives and vice versa. Okay? So that is a key issue. So what the, the, the headache comes about because if you look at what we have done in the previous thing, we only paid attention to one curve, we did not ask the question what might the other hypothesis behave like which is the case here. Okay. So if you start paying attention to an alternate hypothesis you suddenly realize that yes I might have a diagnostic kit for example which is accurate 95 percent of the time that is what that confidence interval tells you but what is and therefore 5 percent of the time I am making a mistake of a certain kind let us say I am falsely calling somebody positive, so false positives but what is not giving me information at all is what is my false negative rate and for the false negative rate you ought to be looking at the other curve and this beta. So in other words you want beta to be small, you want alpha to be small, you want beta to be small, 1 minus beta is called the power of a test and it is a good practice to ask whenever you claim that something was a significant candidate, a significant target, do not just tell me how significant was that result, tell me how powerful that test was. In other words tell me what is this value beta 
that I might therefore actually have a lousy test. So, this power of a test is a concept which most again is there it is buried somewhere in software typically as an option for you to report, but it is not something researchers are in the habit of reporting. So, when somebody tells me I have found a candidate and in fact, I found a short list of candidates which are all significant, what they are not telling me is how powerful was the analysis, what they are not telling me therefore, is what was the probability that they got the analysis wrong the other way around. While they are telling me that they are confident to within 95 percent, percent what they are not telling me is whether this was so bad that this was 20 percent or 30 percent or 40 percent the purple area. If one of these values is greater than 10 percent your study your analysis is already in trouble. So, both alpha and beta both these shaded areas cannot be large because they are both errors in your interpretation. And here are cartoons which quickly improve the point. So, if you are trying to distinguish two hypotheses and your two hypotheses are so similar to each other therefore, the effect size is small you will have such an overlap between the two the predictions coming out of the two hypotheses that you are unable to discriminate and say which hypothesis is true you will not be able to do that. Okay. If you have a bunch of replicates, if you have a bunch of replicates your I am not getting into the math of this, but your curves get thinner if your curves are thinner. So, the spread in here is thin if your curves are thinner the overlap is reduced compared to here. So, you in, in a nutshell you want more replicates of any analysis that you do otherwise your errors are going to be large. Okay. If you are going to make your confidence interval large if somebody says that really ought not to be talking about 95 percent confidence you need 99 percent confidence then the immediate outcome to you is the moment you move your error bar sorry your bar your thresholds further out this purple area which was small here has become large here. So, that that worsens the case. So, there is no clean solution here the moment you try to improve one sense situation something else in your analysis is going to worsen somewhere else. And my point is to prove that everything is interlinked and you therefore, ought to be talking about significance of a result as well as okay, whether this is a powerful test being done. This is a famous study and it is really worth looking this up on your own later on. Amgen is one of the two top biotech companies in the world. Okay. They make they are the, the dominant manufacturer of biopharmaceuticals protein drugs for the most part and while initially they worked on things which are already discovered in research labs increasingly they have been doing their own research trying to find out what is the next generation of pharmaceuticals that have to be manufactured. They obviously keep track of literature. So, one of the things they did was they took 53 landmark papers published in the top journals in oncology and hematology. These are publications coming out of MIT, Caltech, Stanford, Berkeley, the top labs, the top universities in the world, 53. And their logic was these are all published in the top journals. Let us repeat these results in house. And if as is published these candidates are good candidates let us get into the business of manufacturing these candidates that is where they were going. Okay. So, out of 53 they could reproduce only 6 papers and this is MIT, Caltech, Stanford we are not talking of some small tiny college somewhere. So, what is going on? It is not that people at MIT and Berkeley and Caltech were cheating it is not that they were deliberately cheating but there is a situation where the results coming out of the even these top labs cannot be reproduced. So, why do you think they cannot be reproduced? Okay. In the 6 cases where the results could be reproduced when you look at carefully what happened okay, attention had been paid to doing the right controls in the experiment. You need the right controls you do not make claims about results based on only a test case you do the controls the reagents were reproducible and this you will realize most of you are doing experiments wet lab experiments reagents especially in the immunology space are hard to obtain in a reproducible fashion antibodies in particular okay, batch to batch variation exists and you are unable to reproduce results. So, in the 6 cases there was the ability to manufacture these reagents reproducibly and that made a huge difference. Okay. The investigators were not biased they did not they were not trying to push for a particular insight or an outcome and importantly they were honest about reporting all their data. So, you remember that straight line plot where I deleted the mid, mid section of the data and then you claim a better result than it actually is. They were honest enough to claim all or, or at least report all their data which meant that when somebody tried to reproduce it they also saw some bad data equal, equally bad to what these guys had found. 
it's a surprising result. It tells you to what extent there is pressure on people to publish positive insights, okay, even at the top labs. And the moment this study came out, and when this pharma company published this insight, okay, many companies started paying suit. So Bayer did a similar study. They looked at 67 targets published in the literature. Bayer is another big pharma major. And out of 67, they could reproduce 14 results. Which tells you this is a serious, serious problem. Okay. Now this problem goes beyond just statistics alone. So you can argue that a lot of that is bad luck with data not being reproducible because of the one time you do this experiment with that one material and inherently it's not a reproducible experiment. Okay. But it also reflects other aspects of poor design. So here's one experiment of poor design where you're screening for certain drugs to do with epigenetic control in, glab, uh, in a glab uh, blastoma system. And the screen which was done was an in vitro screen. So there's two ways finally this got done, an in vitro screen and you're using basically relying on an RNA interference kind of protocol to try to identify targets. And the in vivo screen, where this is the in vivo screen where you're directly loading these cells onto the brain and then looking for changes in function. The in vivo screen and the in vitro screen have practically no overlap in terms of what's up regulated and what's down regulated. Okay, which means if you had just done the in vitro experiment and you had generated a bunch of targets and you had then proposed to now okay, design drug candidates against these targets, you would have wasted a huge amount of money. Okay. There have been several such things. You start going through the literature, you'll see these things. You know, it's not something conventionally that journals published. So this is published elsewhere. Some of these ironically are published in blogs. They're not published necessarily in journals. There have, for example, been studies on looking at gene signatures, predicting the response of uh, breast cancer to chemotherapy. Okay. And in this case, the problems are even more uh, ridiculous. In this case, and this is another strategic problem with handling large data sets. One of the things that happened here is when the researcher, and they finally traced it to a student, um, this was at Duke University. When this data set, omics data set was finally taken into a spreadsheet and subsequent analysis was done and this data set was sorted, many columns got sorted, one column did not get sorted. And now every gene is being assigned or all these numbers are being assigned to the wrong gene labels, gene IDs. This was one mistake which happened very early on in a rush to carry out this analysis. Nobody followed that up and it went through an entire analytics pipeline, okay, bioinformatics. Drug candidates were created, probe sets were created, okay. Three clinical trials were started on human patients on this basis and a huge amount of money was spent by NIH in running clinical, clinical trials you'll appreciate are billion dollar experiments sometimes. And millions of dollars later in this case, because this was an early clinical trial, early stage clinical trial, millions of dollars later, when the Duke researchers went back to NIH and said, our results are not reproducible, these candidates, despite the bioinformatics, don't seem to work in reality. And the hard question got asked, why? Show your lab notebooks. You go all the way back and you look at the printouts of these spreadsheets and you suddenly realize one column has not been shuffled and sorted. And it comes down to a simple IT mistake which has wasted a lot of time and money. These are huge clinical trials, okay. It could have been worse if people had died as a consequence or been seriously hurt as a consequence of the trial because you're actually playing around with therapies or proposed therapies. It could have been much, much worse in terms of how this would have hurt the university and the researchers. So I'm giving you a bunch of links here. Really what, what I wanted to appreciate is leaving data analysis and statistics as an afterthought to a bioinformatics pipeline is a dangerous business. Remember that phrase I came up with, hypothesis after results are known. There is this philosophy that getting the data is a hard thing. Therefore, all the effort goes into getting the data. And once you get the data, you say you'll actually get down to doing the science. But really, it should have been the other way around. 
they should have been a robust experimental method and a computational method identified before the experiment was even done. And then you report whatever results you get as per that methodology. In fact, the, the whole publishing paradigm in the omics space is going to change now. And for example, journals like Nature are already starting to follow an altered publication protocol where they're so concerned about the fact that data is first generated and hypotheses are created that they're saying, look, the entire review process must now happen in two stages. So in stage number one, before you even do your experiments, you actually try to publish a paper. And this is a weird thing. You try to publish a paper and you submit to the editor a protocol that you wish to follow. So you say that, look, I wish to work on such and such a system. These are the experimental methods I'm going to use. And this is a statistical analysis that I propose to do once I get this data. And you want a reviewer system, a bunch of reviewers, to look at this protocol and tell you in advance whether this is correct or not. OK? Why? Why would you do this? Because remember, we are under pressure to publish positive results and not negative results. So how do you take away that pressure? So one way to take away this pressure is to say, let your methodology be accepted by the peer group, the editors and the reviewers. And at this point, regardless of whether your results are good or not, they publish the paper. So you get guaranteed publication of this paper after a protocol is approved. Okay. So therefore, before you even publish, you talk of how you're going to assess your data sets. Okay. What is the hypothesis, in other words? What's the protocol that you're going to follow, both experimental and computational? And what's your detailed analysis plan of how you're going to interpret which gene sets are important to you and which are not? Okay. And at this point, if they are of acceptable standards, you're guaranteed publication. And afterwards, you publish the data that you actually generated, both good data and bad data, because now there's no penalty if you publish bad data. One argument against this has been that if you're going to allow people to just publish a protocol, and in fact, I have to announce my analysis protocol in advance, does that allow you to do more creative analysis later on? Because you're forced, you're locked into some kind of analysis already, because that's what got approved. But the reality is, okay, as long as you label this extra analysis that you do, in fact, it's called a post hoc analysis, as long as you flag it in your publication that this was done afterwards, it's still acceptable to the peer review community. So this is a game changer in the way the omics okay, industry is going to potentially function down the road. So at the, at the moment, it's small. It's probably like 30 journals which have signed on to this kind of a paradigm for publication. But it's a community which is so concerned of that what they're doing is not a pretty school that they're willing to okay, collectively go by this protocol of publication. So I want to spend a few last minutes on what might happen. So if you're not if it's not a good idea to analyze one gene at a time and ask what's important or what's not important as a candidate, what else can you do? One of the things that's lost to you when you analyze one gene at a time, basically in any system when you analyze one component at a time, what you lose sight of is what are the linkages between the components. It's kind of like saying in a car, I've got each component and I'll try to separately study each component. And if you were to study each component, yes, you know precisely how a brake works, how an accelerator works. But what you don't know is how the car works given a brake and accelerator. You don't understand how the system works. Okay? And clearly, there's some interaction between the brake and the accelerator which finally governs how the system works. And these interactions are lost to you if you study things in isolation. So the only solution, therefore, in a computational manner is if you take things into a multivariate mode. Don't study things one at a time. Study the whole data set at one shot. Okay, not one variable at a time. It turns out there are many ways in which you can do this. I'm just throwing a few buzzwords out there. Okay, some of you will be familiar if you have done courses in bioinformatics, you'll be familiar with things like clustering. Okay, hierarchical clustering is something that, uh, the, for example, phylogenetics, or multiple sequence alignment methods would require. Okay, for example, if you're building some kind of a tree of species, okay, or how genes have evolved over time. So these are all approaches where whole data sets get interpreted at one shot. And if you start looking through the pattern recognition literature, and again, I'm throwing more buzzwords at you, you'll realize there's a whole bunch of methods available to you out there. Some of these may get built into some omics tools, but they are more likely to be present in some statistics toolbox, in which case you have to make the effort to go to that toolbox and try to figure out what's going on. Um, 
Now, trying to find patterns in multivariate data sets can be problematic for many reasons. For example, go back to this omics question of you have carried out an experiment, control versus test case, and you're looking for fold change. You'll ask the question, what's been, you, you would normally have asked the question, to what extent has something been upregulated or downregulated? If something's upregulated you know, on a log scale beyond, let's say, twofold, that's got to be significant for you. So you're going to make that kind of an argument. Now, one of the problems is why is twofold an important cutoff and not some other lower cutoff? And I can give you, for example, I can give you a simple kinetic argument for why a value of two is arbitrary. Think of two branched pathways, A is going to B going to C, A going to B going to C, and A is going to P going to Q. So two branched pathways, A, B, C, A, P, Q. These, let's say, are metabolic pathways. There's some metabolism going on. There's branched metabolism at A. Something's going down one pathway to C. Something's going down to Q. If you were to look at fold changes, so if I upregulate something at A, that upregulation of an activity at A cascades into some change for B and some change into C. It starts impacting changes for B and C, and similarly for P and Q. Which guys would you expect to be the most upregulated as a function of uh, fold change at A? If I have a fold change of A as twofold, what can I expect at B and P? B and P can go up fivefold. Because I have typically a transcriptional regulator being toggled a little bit. That effect starts impacting some effector genes a bit more. And that goes further down, so very quickly. So this is what I was saying. So if I've gone up twofold here, and you're trying to say this is significant, then it's typically the case in a metabolic pathway that this goes up something like fivefold, and this goes up something like 50-fold. Because the end products start accumulating even more. So, and why is nature behaving this way? Because it doesn't make sense to directly push this up 50-fold. Because then you lose control over you lose fine-tuned control over how things propagate down different pathways, and you want to control the expression levels of each intermediate to various pathways. Okay? If I asked you to find out those, those species which are most upregulated, you'd have told me C and Q are most upregulated because they have the highest fold changes. Okay? Therefore, if you were to cluster them, if you didn't know better, if I didn't draw this pathway structure and you simply told me this went up 50-fold from a spreadsheet and this went up 50-fold from a spreadsheet, one, in, one, one temptation at this point is to assume that there's a relationship between C and Q. That C and Q are both path, part of, let's say, some operon, and that's why the whole operon has gone up 50-fold. When there's no connection between C and Q, but the connections are via this. Okay. So if you wanted a cluster, if the question was being asked, what's a cluster of effector genes which are going up as a response to whatever intervention you did? The cluster was not C and Q as one cluster and B and P as another cluster because they would be clustered on the basis of fold changes. Remember, that's not a cluster. What should have been a cluster? This should have been a cluster and this should have been a cluster because there's a more obvious biological explanation as to how there's a cascade effect in terms of up or down regulation as you go down pathways. And you can immediately see, therefore, that any clustering approach which now clusters on under an assumption of fold change alone is problematic. If you're going to start grouping together candidates or targets on the basis of expression levels alone, that's a problem. Okay? So you've got to be looking for relationships. So what's a relationship? What you want to start looking for is, if I move this up, is something else going up? Is something else going up? Is something coming down? Is something else going up? And what you want to see is in every patient, across every patient, across every disease condition, if these things are going up and down in coordinated fashion, then there's something going on between this bunch, and that bunch deserves to be clustered. This is some genotypic relationship that you're now seeing across these species because they're ultimately related by one physical process. Okay? Now, that's a subtlety because I'm now saying I'm not so interested in the raw magnitudes of these up and down fold changes. That's not important to me. What is more important to me is whether, whether the level of this goes up when this goes up 
whether this goes up two fold or whether it goes up 1.5 fold, does this go up across all patients? Okay, and when this goes up, does this go up? And those kinds of pairwise relationships is what I start looking for. But what is what? What do we call those pairwise? If I were plotting a line between x and y, you'd call that pairwise relationship a correlation coefficient. That r square value that I, I showed you a while back. So here's suddenly an insight. Instead of simply saying, let me look at fold changes and ask, is the fold change important? And then trying to identify targets on that basis. Sometimes it's more intriguing to ask the question, are correlations between pairs of candidates important? And is that telling you something? And now the reason I bring that up is if I were to somehow plot this data, okay, if you look at the previous slide, these are things where clusters are based on magnitude. So the 50 fold change guys are all together, the five fold change guys are all together and so on. But if I wanted to look at correlations, that's a different model, okay? So correlation structures are usually way more important in biology than simple fold changes because that fold change could have occurred with sheer bad luck. That 50 fold, for example, could remember all our discussion of randomness, 50 fold could have been because of bad luck. So instead, you need correlation based analysis. If you're talking about hierarchy, is there, are, there cor are species correlating amongst themselves in a hierarchical analysis? So choose something based on a correlation analysis, okay? There are methods out there, for example, on gene set enrichment, which say that we build clusters based on which genes are together. One statistical tool, which is what I'll end up with, is something called correspondence analysis, where we have looked at how things cluster together. It's something we have done, okay, for a series of um, data sets. In this case, for a medulloblastoma okay, analysis across uh, different uh, types. So what you're seeing are different patient types and you're looking different patients and samples and you're looking for what's the relationship between them. These are all exploratory methods where somebody is saying we have got so many tissue samples across so many patients. Can you find out how many subsets of medulloblastomas you might find? And where this is going is nobody knows the cause, okay? What, how many subgroups might exist with this particular disease condition? And then later on you ask the question, what, what could be causing or what, what is the signature for that subgroup? Which genes are signatures for each subgroup? But the question as to how many subgroups exist in the first place is itself an open question, okay? So if I were to do hierarchical clustering, I'll find this kind of an analysis. If I were to use something called correspondence analysis, that same data is plotted. It's literally the same spreadsheet, but it's being plotted different ways. And I want you to appreciate that there is no one perfect way to do this, which is why a better analysis to try different ways. Now, in this case, then interpretation is slightly different. So here, most of you are familiar with how to interpret this. Two nodes in here are very closely related, relative to something else over here. But as here, okay, you're essentially asking whether things are far away from the center. At the center, you've got an average condition for a tissue sample. As you move further away, these are all patients. These are all patients. As you move further away, you're move deviating from the normal. Okay, so distance from the origin matters. And if you're moving on a diagonal away from the origin, all these guys on a diagonal are related. So my notion of a cluster is no longer a nice cloud, spherical cloud. So this group of patients is a cluster. Out here is some other cluster. And there's another group of patients behaving differently. Which is not, which kind of shows up here. There's one cluster here, there's one cluster here, there's another cluster here of patients, okay? So different ways of interpreting this throw different insights out. What was very useful about this method was the fact that it allows, allow, allows one to not just plot patients, but you can also on the same coordinate system plot genes. So remember your data set. You've got different patients or different sample conditions. And for each sample condition based on your omics okay, for, uh, throughput, you have so many gene expression levels or protein expression levels, same logic. And now I'm plotting just the genes and asking, these are all the normal genes, housekeeping genes probably, okay, marginally changing the expression levels. And ask the question, which genes are sitting out at the extremes? Which genes radi radially are furthest away from the origin? Those genes are probably doing something interesting in terms of having their expressions always go up or down based on, okay, a correlation with other patients. What's being plotted is not raw magnitude, but correlation coefficients, okay? So these genetic candidates are all related to each other somehow. And one insight, by the way, is that when one goes looking in, 
these gene candidates are all related to one particular signaling pathway. And no surprise that they are all nicely correlated with each other. One guy went up, so many other genes responded to that signal and went up and down. So they all show up as a cluster on this axis. Another bunch of genes are clustered around here and so on. And what's very powerful about this analytical procedure is you can then superpose this on top of this and you then ask, remember the clusters of patients we had, there's a cluster of patients here and another cluster of patients. Now what are genetic signatures? So these genes over here are signatures okay, specific to this cluster of patients. Okay. Now what has happened here is rather than test one gene at a time, and we know the problems now of testing one gene at a time, by sheer bad luck, 5% of the time we get things wrong, that can mount as an error rate if I'm doing 10,000 analysis. Instead, the entire cloud of data, the entire matrix of data is being analyzed. When you think about this, these are columns, my patients are columns, my genes are rows in a data set. So I'm looking at columns of patients, I'm looking at rows of genes, and I'm looking at the two things superimposed, and I'm looking at all my data, somehow projected at one shot, and what I learned from this methodology is that a subset of genes here is associated with these patients, a different subset of genes is associated with a different set of patients, and so on, and I already found my clusters and my markers for the subtypes. Okay. So it turns out that in the statistics world, at least in the multivariate statistics world, the appropriate methodology for statistical analysis of this data set existed. Just was a case of being a little adventurous and going out there and trying to find out, could, was there a method which would more accurately ask, answer this question of what were relevant targets and not simply trust the least complicated statistical procedure. And the least complicated statistical procedure was just one gene at a time and that procedure is prone to a large number of mistakes. Okay, whereas a more robust approach which looks at all the data at one shot in a multivariate mode captured relationships very fast. We go looking, it's turned out there are nice insights about why these genetic, why these genes were part of a signaling pathway and how defects in one particular gene could escalate into this condition. That has led to better science. The same thing has been done later on, okay, again for proteomics data for different, for classifying different types of infections from blood. So if you're looking, so I'm not sure you can make this out other than the colors here, but these are healthy patients, blood from healthy patients, and they're a nice cluster on their own, okay? You're looking at um, uh, falciparum malaria, you're looking at vivax malaria, and you can clearly see there's a differentiation between vivax and falciparum that shows out when I just cluster this data at one shot. So we're able to therefore fundamentally differentiate falciparum from uh, uh, vivax as a, as a malaria type and in fact we have gone further beyond this to ask is there a differentiation for example from leptospirosis which are all conditions that you would normally see as blood infections causing a high fever and so if somebody wants a rapid diagnosis okay, here is an approach which does this and I am not showing all the data here but you are seeing a subset of your gene candidates and clearly these gene candidates are capable of differentiating multiple clusters. It's a multivariate analysis, it's not a question of one of these genes being analyzed at a time. In fact, you go the other way around. You analyze all the data at one shot on one plot, ask which gene subsets are important, and then go and ask for each individual gene, why did it turn out to be important? You don't flip it the other way around and ask each gene, are you important or not, and then try to make a story out of it. Instead, the whole data set gets analyzed at one shot, a subset is chosen, and each one is reconfirmed as being important one at a time. Okay, so. I'm not expecting you guys to turn statisticians overnight, but this is more in terms of being aware that there are methods out there, and there's several other methods out there which improve the quality of your analysis. So, in a nutshell, there are several um, approaches, and it's, it's a democratic philosophy, which is don't trust one method, don't trust one voter, you trust many people to vote for a given candidate, and if there are independent statistical methods, which are all seemingly voting for the same target, then you've probably found a target. If one method alone is talking about a target, then it's probably bad luck and probably not a significant target. Okay, so that's another insight to take from this. So okay, I'll stop there. So today's lecture, 
I hope you have learnt about the errors created due to the lack of knowledge and understanding about the p-values. We also studied how the bone Ferrani corrections can help in reduction of false positive and false negative candidates from the data sets. You also heard the role of false positive and false negatives in search of potential biomarkers with increased sensitivity and its specificity. I hope it also reminded you Dr. Josh Lebet's one of the previous lectures about a good biomarker and considerations for biomarker discovery programs. So, again you can see that you know different experts have same opinion about the experimental design, how to really find the, the right candidates, the right targets could be potential biomarker or drug discovery targets, especially sorting out based on the false positives and false negatives. So, I hope these two lectures have made you much more aware about the need for the experimental design and various crucial considerations in data analysis. But before I close, let me give you the overall summary of all the lectures which we have covered in this course. So, we started this course from the basic microarray technologies, especially the nucleic acid programmable protein array and one of the leading experts in the area, Professor Joshua Laber gave you some very interesting lectures about the basics of these technology as well as different applications with more focus on biomarker discovery program in various diseases. We then learnt about how to use NAPA technology for a screening of various autoantibodies in different disease conditions or use the same technology platform for drug discovery screening. We also learnt about how to use these technology platforms for protein interactions and looking at various type of protein modifications. So, various these examples, these applications have brought in your horizon that these technologies could be used for identification of biomarkers, the therapeutic targets and for the functional proteomics based screening. We also got a chance to look into applications of other type of array based platforms, especially the reverse phase protein arrays and also the considerations of making good arrays and making good slides by doing good type of printing. Then different type of applications of purified protein arrays using few prod chips were shown to you directly with the demonstration sessions from my research scholars in the laboratory, where you learnt about some examples of malaria and the cancer research, how it could be beneficial by employing the protein microarray based technologies. Next we learnt about very briefly immunoprecipitation and the use of the advanced mass spectrometry based technologies. Of course, we did not talk too much about mass spectrometry in this course because that was not the scope of this course, but this is one of the very promising technology which is helping now entire field of interactomics or entire field of proteomics to say for various applications. So, of course, you should try to get more advanced training in this area, but at least one of the application we try to give you emphasis that IP followed by MS is a strong platform to identify the potential interactors. During these lectures, we also try to give you the idea that different type of label free biosensors are very important. While label based technologies may have some bias for what the signal looks like, is that a real signal, is that an artifact, you have to negate many of the false positives, many of these false fluorescent signal, those possibilities in these experiments. But the label free sensors, label free technologies have tried to overcome that and look for just the biomolecular interactions in its original state. So, trying to avoid many of the confounding factors which one may observe in routine microarray based technologies. So, I hope technologies like biolayer interferometry BLI, surface plasma resonance based technology like SPR and micro scale thermophoresis technologies have really given you the broad idea that many of the label free biosensors could also be used for biomolecular interaction studies. Along with these technologies of microarrays and label free biosensors, one of the latest advancement in the entire biomedical field is about next generation sequencing technologies. And these sequencing technologies 
have immense applications for the entire genome sequencing to RNA sequencing to variety of applications. And we try to give you at least some idea for what can be done using NGS platforms with two of the leading industry uh, key players and their application scientists from Illumina and Thermo Fisher to talk to you about the latest advancement in this area as well as the possible applications which could be used on these technology platforms. Then we also had interaction with one of the leading scientists and a clinician Dr. Sanjay Nawani who talked to you about another mega project of human protein atlas and the very important role of India in doing the pathology atlas project and the associated challenges of this journey and the major outcomes of this project. So, all of these rapidly evolving technology platforms have immense applications in life sciences and translational biology. They also provide a much comprehensive picture for better understanding of the crucial physiological processes in systems approach. So, I hope these lectures, various discussion points have really made you aware the pros and cons of designing these experiments and using the technologies, choosing the right technology for your given experiment. I hope these weekly assignments and live interactive sessions were helpful and you enjoyed attending this course as much as we made efforts to teach you this course and these advanced technologies. Thank you very much.